Good afternoon. I'm David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Cato Institute. <clears throat> and I want to welcome you all here today for our discussion of neoconservatism and particularly for whether neoconservatism as an idea is ready for an obituary, as this book proposes. I find the word neoconservative tossed around in a lot of ways without a whole lot of meaning. In fact, I wrote a blog post this morning complaining about the loose way people were these days using Tea Party, which I think has sort of replaced neoconservative as the all-purpose slur of anybody perceived to be on the right. Uh, in my perception, neoconservatism and Tea Partyism are fairly different, but I have a feeling Dana Milbank would be hard-pressed to explain how he might see the difference. For myself, I have often wondered and sometimes asked at conferences like this, what does it mean to be a conservative in a country founded in libertarian revolution? What is it you're conserving in a liberal country? And I think that's a good question for conservatives. Then you get to the more complicated question, well then, Whatever, once you figure out what conservatism is, what is neoconservatism? Now me, I'm a traditionalist, and I like my neoconservatives to be neo. I don't like this idea of I'm a lifelong neoconservative. What does that mean? If you weren't anything before. I like the good old days of disillusioned ex-Trotskyists being neoconservatives. Um, I also remember the a uh, wonderful phrase, which I actually Googled around and could not confirm who had originally said, but I understand that someone at some point said, a neoconservative is a liberal who has been mugged. And what everybody does know is the very effective repost from uh, is Irving Kristol, a neoconservative is a liberal who has been mugged by reality. I would say that my own partner at home sort of qualifies as a neoconservative on both counts. He was, in fact, mugged once or twice in New York City during the uh, depths of the, the crime-ridden days there before Giuliani, and it absolutely moved him from left to right. But he would tell you that wasn't the reason, that he was, in fact, mugged by reality, by seeing uh, the dysfunction of the welfare state, by seeing the dysfunction of uh, the, the post a uh, new left kind of left. Neoconservatives were perhaps best uh, 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 identified with the magazine The Public Interest, which published piercing critiques of the great society and the welfare state in practice, if not always in theory. Uh, there always seemed to be a, a more theoretical acceptance of the welfare state than you would find in libertarian and perhaps traditionally conservative journals. But in practice, these were the most incisive critiques being published. But later, some would say neoconservative came to mean simply big government conservatives. But that's certainly one of the things we'll be talking about here. One thing I never understood was the alleged connection to Leo Strauss, and maybe after today's discussion, I will understand that. Our first speaker today, the author of Neoconservatism, an obituary for an idea, is C. Bradley Thompson, who is a professor of political science at Clemson University and the executive director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. He received his PhD at Brown University, He's been a visiting scholar at Princeton and Harvard and at the University of London. Before getting into this subject, he was the author of the award-winning book, John Adams and the Spirit of Liberty, the editor of two books, The Revolutionary Writings of John Adams and Anti-Slavery Political Writings. Um, and he was also a co-editor of the four-volume Encyclopedia of the Enlightenment. After Brad speaks, we'll have a response from Todd Lindbergh, Todd is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and editor of Policy Review, their bi-monthly policy journal. He is the author of The Political Teachings of Jesus. He is editor of Beyond Paradise and Power, Europe, America, and the Future of a Troubled Partnership, and co-author of Means to an End, U.S. Interest in the International Criminal Court. He's a member of the Hoover Institution's Task Force on the Virtues of a Free Society. He is a contributing editor of the Weekly Standard, and he is an honors graduate in political science of the University of Chicago, where he studied political philosophy with Alan Bloom and Saul Bellow, among others. Please welcome Brad Thompson. Uh, 
Uh, well, thank you, David, for that introduction, uh, and uh, to the Cato Institute for hosting this event. Uh, I'd like to thank Todd Lindbergh for taking time out of his very busy day to be here today uh, with us uh, and to share his uh, thoughts on uh, my book. Uh, a special uh, shout out to Tom Palmer uh, for um, supporting this book and I think uh, for first bringing it maybe to David's uh, attention a few months ago. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jason Kuznicki of Cato Unbound uh, for running in this, this last week um, uh, an essay that I did, uh, Conservatism Unmasked, or Neoconservatism Unmasked, based on, on my book. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Douglas Rasmussen and uh, Damon Linker for their very thoughtful responses uh, to that essay. Now, I have to say, though, uh, I worry that I've been brought here under somewhat false pretenses. David invited me uh, uh, to do a book for him, followed by what he described as a kind of friendly conversation uh, with, with Todd Lindbergh. A few, days ago, uh, a few days ago, I went to David's Facebook page, uh, and to my, horror saw, uh, to my horror saw that he was advertising this event as a smackdown. <laughs> although it was somewhat unclear uh, what or whom was getting smacked down. Well, I guess we're, we're going to find out. Well, what is my book about? Uh, I've written a book about neoconservative political philosophy. So this is not a book about the war in Iraq. It's not a book about Israel, uh, nor is it a history of neoconservatism or its various factions. It's not a book about the neo in neoconservatism. It's not a book about the conservatism in neoconservatism, <coughs> but rather it is a book about the ism in neoconservatism. So what then is neoconservatism? Defining neoconservatism is no small task, given that its exponents deny that it is a systematic political philosophy. Neocons such as Irving Kristol prefer to characterize neoconservatism as a persuasion, an attitude, a mode of thinking, or even as a mood. How exactly does one define a mood? At best, they say it's a syncretic intellectual movement influenced by thinkers as diverse as Plato, Trotsky, and Hayek. Daniel Bell, I think, captured the syncretic nature of neoconservatism when he described himself as a socialist in economics, a liberal in politics, and a conservative in culture. On one level, neoconservatism certainly is a syncretic mode of thinking. But I shall demonstrate today that neoconservatism is, in fact, a comprehensive, systematic political philosophy, shaped most fundamentally, in my view, by the ideas of Leo Strauss via Irving Kristol. So let me begin then uh, with how the neocons present themselves, particularly in relation to the broader intellectual movement and to the Republican Party. Now, Irving Kristol once boasted that neoconservatism is the first variant of conservatism that he said is in the American grain. Now, the implication of this extraordinary claim, for instance, is that Goldwater conservatism with its proclaimed attachment to individual rights, limited government, and laissez-faire capitalism, and its attachment, or it, I'm sorry, its rejection of the welfare regulatory state is somehow outside the American grain. Now, the neoconservatives are and always have been, by contrast, defenders of the post-New Deal welfare state. Not surprisingly, then, the neocons support, in the, in the words of Ben Wattenberg, quote, a muscular role for the state, one that taxes, regulates, and redistributes, and as I shall show later, one that fights. Now, this apparently is what it means, for the neocons at least, to be in the American grain. What really bothers the neocons, however, about small government Republicans is that they lack what, it, what they call a governing philosophy. The neocons lo have long urged the Republican Party to reinvent themselves, by giving up their Jeffersonian principles and de developing a new philosophy of governance. Ironically, though, the neocon's conception of a governing philosophy is not one defined by fixed moral principles. Instead, it's an, it's an intellectual technique defined by pragmatism. 
The neocon's philosophy of govern governance is a philosophy for how to rule or govern. It's about thinking, it's about how to think politically, which means developing strategies for getting, keeping, and using power in certain ways. The neocons therefore urge the GOP to become chameleon-like and to adapt themselves to changing circumstances. The neocons' pragmatic statesmanship is grounded, I think, in two basic assumptions. First, the identification of the public interest with some kind of golden mean. And second, the conceit that they and only they have the practical wisdom by which to know the golden mean. The neocons therefore believe it to be both necessary and possible for wise statesmen to find the golden mean between altruism and self-interest, duties and rights, regulation and competition, religion and science, socialism and capitalism. Norman Podhoritz, for instance, has argued that the neoconservative statesman should be able to figure out, quote, the precise point at which the incentive to work would be undermined by the availability of welfare benefits, or the point at which the redistribution of income would begin to erode economic growth, or the point at which egalitarianism would come into serious conflict with liberty. In the end, the neocon strategy to accept the moral ends of liberal socialism but with the caveat that they can do a better job of delivering the services or that they can direct those services toward conservative ends is their, <clears throat> their particular political method. Now, at the core of my book is the claim that the political philosopher Leo Strauss was the most important influence on Irving Kristol's intellectual development. My book reveals for the first time the importance of Irving Kristol's 1952 review of Strauss's Persecution and the Art of Writing. And for me, this is the Rosetta Stone, in a sense, for understanding the deepest layer of neoconservative political philosophy. Strauss, according to Kristol, had, quote, accomplished nothing less than a revolution in intellectual history. And most of us will, figuratively speaking, have to go back to school to learn the wisdom of the past we thought we knew, close quote. This is the moment, I argue, when neoconservatism was born. Neoconservatism, in other words, in my view, was born philosophically, intellectually, in 1952. And what was it that Crystal learned from Leo Strauss? First, that there is an unbridgeable chasm between theory and practice, philosophy and the city, the wise few and the vulgar many. That is, that there is a radical disjunction between what Strauss called the realm of theoretical truth, that is, the realm inhabited by philosophers, and the realm of practical moral guidance, that is, the realm inhabited by non-philosophers. And what this meant for Strauss is that Platonic idealism is compatible with Machiavellian realism. Two. The West, Strauss argued, is in a state of moral decline, as seen by the rise of philosophic and cultural nihilism. He identified the source of modern nihilism with enlightenment liberalism, that is, with the liberalism of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson. Strauss was a trenchant critic of modern rationalism and science, natural rights individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism, all of which, he argued, turned man away from a supranatural reality to nature, from faith to reason, from community to the individual, from duty to rights, from inequality to equality, from order to freedom, and from self-sacrifice to self-interest. The result is that man and society have become unhinged from the natural moral order and from the religious faith necessary to sustain moral and political unity. Three, platonic political philosophy for Strauss, is a necessary antidote to the maladies of modern rationalistic society. And for Strauss, classical natural right was defined by four principles. First, the political community is the primary unit of moral and political value, which means that the common good is the end of the regime and the coerced unity is the means to that end. Second, a truly just political order should mirror quote, the hierarchic order of man's natural constitution, which means that some men are more fit to rule than others. Third, 
That which is naturally right for any given society for Strauss is always changing depending on circumstances, which means that philosophic statesmen should not be hampered by conventional morality or the rule of law. And finally, virtue and the public interest represent the end or the purpose of the city, which means that wise statesmen must use what Strauss called benevolent coercion in order to make their citizens virtuous. And the last big point that Crystal learned from Strauss was this. Platonic statesmen should ground the regime on certain ancestral pieties and political myths. And the cardinal virtue for the vulgar many is self-sacrifice. Now, Straussianized neoconservatism neo is defined by what ne uh, Irving Crystal called a new synthesis of ideas, a synthesis he characterized as classical realist in nature and in temperament. At the core of neoconservatism is a fundamental dualism that combines what Strauss called the way of Thrasymachus with the way of Socrates. Platonic natural right, that is the realm of theoretical truth, provides the ultimate standard of justice for neoconservative statesmen. Yet the messy day-to-day -day reality of politics means that conventional morality and sometimes even Machiavellian prudence, that is the realm of practical moral reasoning, are both necessary and salutary. Philosophically, Strauss thought it possible to advocate what he called sh the shrewd power politics of Machiavelli within a larger platonic framework that separates theory from practice. Thus, Crystal learned how to reconcile platonic idealism, the classical thesis, with Machiavellian prudence, the realist thesis, antithesis, to create the neoconservative synthesis. What then are the core principles of neoconservatism? And one of the things that I've tried to do in this book is to, is to present neoconservatism as a systematic, integrated, comprehensive political philosophy. It's more than just a persuasion or a mood. So first, I believe that the neoconservatives have a metaphysics. They take the political community, or what Irving Kristol called the collective self, as the primary unit of moral and political value. They accept Plato's premise that the polis or the nation is the only community adequate for the fulfillment of man's natural end, which they associate with what they variously call the public interest or the common good. The actual content of the public interest is whatever wise men say it is, which is precisely why it should never be defined. And the highest task of neoconservative statesmanship is to superimpose a kind of uh, ideological unity on the collective self in the name of this ever-shifting public interest. Two, the neoconservatives have a view of knowledge, or they have a view of the way the human mind works. Neoconservatives begin with the platonic assumption that ordinary people are irrational and must be guided by those who are rational. According to Irving Kristol, there are, quote, and listen to this carefully, there are different kinds of truth for different kinds of people. There are truths appropriate for children, truths appropriate for students, truths that are appropriate for educated adults, and the notion that there should be one set of truths available to everyone is a modern democratic fallacy." Close quote. The highest truth in Strauss and Crystal is restricted to the philosopher, while the common man is and must be limited to knowledge of a different sort, to myth, revelation, and custom. Neoconservatives believe the opinions of the nation must therefore be shaped by those who rule. To control ideas is to control public opinion, which is to control the regime as a whole. Ultimately, the vulgar, the vulgar many, must be ruled by faith and by faith's necessary ally, force. What about the neoconservative <clears throat> neo ethics? If you believe, as Straussianized neocons do, that there are different kinds of truth for different kinds of people, then you must believe that there are and must be different kinds of moral codes as well. Ordinary people need some form of conventional morality that is easily learned, followed, and transmitted from one generation to another. The vulgar many need piety and patriotism as the ordering myths by which to live. 
for the neocons, morality is conventional and pragmatic. Because they regard the nation as the primary unit of political value, and because they identify the public interest with the purpose of government, they regard moral good and virtue to be that which works, not for the individual, but for the nation. Morality is therefore defined as overcoming one's petty self-interest so as to sacrifice for the common good. And then there's the neoconservative politics. Central to the neoconservatives' philosophy of governance is the conceit that it is possible, in the words of Irving Kristol, for a small elite to, quote, to have an a priori knowledge of what constitutes happiness for other people, close quote. The highest purpose of neoconservative statesmanship is, therefore, to shape preferences, form habits, cultivate virtues and create the good society, a society that is known a priori to those men of superior philosophic wisdom. The neocons therefore advocate using government force to make good decisions for America's non-philosophers in order to nudge them in certain directions, that is, toward choosing a life of virtue and duty. As Strauss made clear in his most influential work, Natural Right in History, statesmen must learn to use what he called forcible constraint and benevolent coercion in order to keep down the selfish and base desires of ordinary men and women. Now, the culmination of the neoconservatives' political philosophy is their call for national greatness conservatism. Following Crystal and Strauss, David Brooks, William Crystal, and a new generation of neocons proclaimed the nation as the fundamental unit of political reality nationalism as the rallying cry for a new public morality, and the national interest as the moral standard of political decision-making. Morally, the purpose of national greatness conservatism is, according to David Brooks, to energize the American spirit, to fire the imagination with something majestic, to advance a unifying American creed, and to inspire Americans to look beyond their narrow self-interest to some larger national mission, to some mystically Hegelian national destiny. The new American citizen must be animated by nationalist virtues such as duty, loyalty, and self-sacrifice. The neocon's basic moral principle is clear and simple the subordination and sacrifice of the individual to the nation state. Politically, Brooks's new nationalism would use the federal government to pursue great nationalistic public projects and to build grand monuments in order to unify the nation spiritually and to prevent America's slide into what he calls nihilistic mediocrity. It is important that the American people, he thinks, conform, swear allegiance to, and obey some grand central purpose defined by, for them by the federal government. The ideal American man, he argues, should negate and forego his individual values and interests and merge his self into some mystical union with the collective soul. This is precisely why Brooks, in uh, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times last year, praised the virtues of Chinese collectivism over those of American-style individualism. In the end, the neocons want to remoralize America by creating a new patriotic civil religion around the idea of Americanism, an Americanism that will essentially redefine the American grain. The neoconservative vision of a good America is one in which ordinary people work hard, read the Bible, go to church, recite the Pledge of Allegiance, practice homespun virtue, sacrifice themselves for the common good, obey the commands of government, fight wars, and ultimately die for the state. The neocons' national greatness philosophy is also the animating force behind their foreign policy. Indeed, neoconservative foreign policy is a branch of its domestic policy. The grand purpose of national greatness foreign policy is to inspire the American people to transcend their vulgar, infantilized, and selfish interests for uplifting national projects. The neoconservatives' policy of benevolent hegemony will, according to William Crystal and Robert Kagan, quote, relish the opportunity for national engagement embrace the possibility of national greatness, and restore a sense 
of the heroic, close quote. In other words, America should wage war in order to combat creeping nihilism. In the revealing words of Crystal and Kagan, quote, the remoralization of America at home ultimately requires the remoralization of American foreign policy, close quote. Going to war, sacrificing both treasure and blood in order to bring democracy to strangers, this, in their view, is the mission worthy of a great nation. The neocons therefore believe that a muscular foreign policy, one that includes military intervention abroad, war, regime change, and imperial governance, will keep the American people politicized and therefore virtuous. By saving the world from tyranny, America will save herself from her own internal corruption. And there's more. By keeping, by keeping America perpetually involved in nation building around the world, neoconservative rulers will have the opportunity to exercise their statesmanlike virtues. There can be no statesmanship without politics, and there can be no truly magnanimous statesmanship without war. So the neocons fear and loathe moral principles that might deny them that outlet. A condition of semi-permanent war, a policy of benevolent hegemony, and the creation of a republican empire means that there will always be a need for politics and statesmanship. Neoconservatism, in my view, as I've tried to demonstrate, is a systematic political philosophy. All the neocons talk about moderation. All, the, all of their talk about moderation and prudence is really only meant to disarm intellectually their competitors in the conservative libertarian movement who want to defend the founders' principles of individual rights and limited government. The neocons preach moderation as a virtue so, th so that ordinary people will accept compromise as inevitable. But a political philosophy that advocates moderation and prudence as its defining principles is either dishonestly hiding its true principles or it re represents a transition stage on the way to some more authoritarian regime or both. So to what then does it all add up? My deepest fear is that the neoconservatives are preparing this nation philosophically for a soft American-style fascism, a fascism purged of its ugliest features and gussied up for an American audience. Now, this is obviously a, various, a very serious charge and not one that I take lightly. The neocons, and I want to make this very clear, the neocons are not fascists, but I do argue that they share some common features with fascism. Consider the evidence, which I lay out in several hundred pages in the book. First, like the fascists, Strauss and the neoconservatives reject the values and principles associated with Enlightenment liberalism, namely reason, egoism, individual rights, material acquisition, limited government, freedom, and capitalism. They are repulsed by the moral ethos associated with liberal capitalism. And they praise the nobility of what they call the barbarian virtues, such as discipline, courage, daring, endurance, loyalty, renunciation, obedience, and sacrifice. For evidence, read Leo Strauss's 1941 lecture on German nihilism. Two, like the fascists, Straussianized neocons are metaphysical collectivists. They take the nation as the primary unit of political value. They view the body politic as an organic whole. They promote social duties over individual rights. They support using the coercive power of the state to promote order and unity. They demand that individuals subordinate themselves to the public interest and serve some fuzzy notion of national greatness. Three, like the fascists, Strauss and the neocons are statists who strongly oppose a depoliticized, that is, a night watchman view of government in favor of a paternalistic, corporatist, omnipotent state. They advocate using the course of power of the state to, regu to regulate man's economic life and his spiritual life. 
And like the fascists, Straussianized neocons downplay the importance of constitutional rules and boundaries, and they glamorize, in particular, the virtues of great statesmen. Like the fascists, finally, Strauss and the neocons believe that life is or should be defined by conflict, and that a state of ongoing peace and prosperity is morally degrading. They advocate keeping the American people in an agitated state of permanent fear and loathing against internal and external threats. They want to militarize American culture. They romanticize the virtues of war and empire as regenerative. And they support a foreign policy of perpetual war in order to restore America's national destiny and sense of greatness. In conclusion, I worry then that the neocons are paving the road for a kind of soft despotism that might even lead one day to a type of fascism. They make us feel comfortable with certain fascist principles by Americanizing them, by draping them in traditional American manners and mores and in the rhetoric of Abraham Lincoln. The neoconservatives are the advocates, I think, of a new managerial state, a state controlled and regulated by a Mandarin class of conservative virtue-crats who think the American people are incapable of governing themselves without the help of the neocons' special a priori wisdom. They are the conservative version, in other words, of FDR's brain trust. They want to regulate virtually all areas of human life, all, all areas of human thought and action. They support government control of the economy as well as government control and regulation of people's private lives. The neocons, in other words, want to regulate the bedroom as much as they want to regulate the boardroom. The neoconservatives, finally, are the false prophets of Americanism. The, and those who wish to defend America's enlightenment values and the individual rights republic created by its revolutionary founders must therefore recapture from the neocons the intellectual and moral high ground that, want, that once defined the promise of American life. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, and thank you for reminding me to watch out not to get uh, caught up in Facebook culture. Um, now, please welcome from the Hoover Institution, Todd Lindbergh. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks to Cato for uh, putting on this uh, event. Uh, thanks to you all for coming. Thanks uh, to Brad for uh, getting the party started. You will have gathered that uh, neoconservatism, uh, an obituary for an idea, is a polemical uh, book. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get, we can get into some of the specifics a little bit later. Um, I guess I'll start with a note of autobiography. Uh, autobiography, I have, uh, you know, 1982 when I left the University of Chicago, I, uh, when I was leaving the University of Chicago, I had two possible destinations. And one was to go up to Toronto. Uh, Alan Bloom had arranged the possibility of my study there with a couple of his uh, fellow members of his school, uh, uh, Tom Pangle and Clifford Orwin. Uh, the other path was to go work for uh, Irving Kristol at the, the Public Interest in New York. Now, I used to think that that represented a choice and a difference, uh, but I'm not sure uh, now, having been enlightened by uh, Professor Thompson on the subject, that there, there really was any such difference. The subtitle of the book is An Obituary for an Idea. And uh, this is an interesting subtitle in many respects, um, not least because uh, I think, you know, if the premise of that is that neoconservatism is dead, which, as you can see, there's a, there's a tombstone uh, on the cover of the book. Uh, I, I think it's quite likely that, you know, zombie-like, the neoconservatives are going to dig themselves up again. And this precise sense in which Brad has described what he means by an obituary uh, is, uh, is, is, is in a way sort of prospective. He, he talks about them. Um, Charlotte Corday writing Marat's obituary on her way to Paris. He does not elaborate. I will spare you uh, your, your trip to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Google on your iPhone. Um, uh, Charlotte Corday, of course, killed Marat uh, in Paris. So I, th I, said, I think the, as the aspiration of the book is, is to produce the condition that 
that the cover depicts, namely the death of, uh, uh, of the, neo uh, the neoconservatism as, a, as an intellectual strain. This will, uh, however, I think be a pretty big project because I was asking, well, how, you know, what all would have to die uh, in order for neoconservatism to disappear uh, as, a, as an intellectual strain. Uh, and and I, 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 I started making a little list, and it seemed to me that the Wall Street Journal editorial page would have to go. The Weekly Standard would have to go. Commentary Magazine would have to go. The publication National Affairs would have to go. Uh, mm, the New Atlantis would have to go. Uh, large chunks of National Review would have to go. Uh, I think there might even be a couple of the people at the Heritage Foundation who might have to go. The American Enterprise Institute, gone. Uh, Hudson Institute, now gone. Uh, the Ethics and Public Policy Center, uh, out. Uh, obviously, a few people at the Hoover Institution. Um, other institutions have not been gone uncontaminated by this tendency. Uh, you know, Bob Kagan sits at the Brookings Institution now, so that's obviously uh, going to be a problem. And Elliot Abrams is at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, uh, of all places. Uh, and I guess, you know, since we're, I, I'm not trying to be comprehensive, but, uh, but the, you know, the Washington Post editorial page is the home of, uh, of Charles Krauthammer, so I guess, you know, there, there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, there's a whole lot of killing that is going to have to go on in order for this vision of the uh, uh, the death of uh, neoconservatism to uh, be realized, and I think that's where my work on uh, preventing mass atrocities and genocide on, in another context may come in handy because we certainly want I, I would certainly hate to see this uh, uh, this degree of carnage wrought upon uh, the American intellectual landscape. Uh, I know I think the better question actually is uh, is the persistence of neoconservatism. Why uh, is something, uh, why has this tendency uh, been around for so long? Uh, and uh, I think I can, I would like to take an opportunity to try to a little, offer a little bit of a, a sense of an answer to that. But first, let's, let's go back. Uh, uh, Neoconservatives, as they tell the story, tend to trace the origins of the movement to, I mean, they may be lying, of course, but they tend to trace the, uh, uh, the origin of the movement to the founding of the uh, of the public interest in the, in the middle of the 1960s. And then, uh, you know, basically you have a number of uh, uh, disaffected uh, academics, uh, mainly social scientists, asking pragmatic questions about how the world works and uh, publishing uh, uh, critiques of the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson, et cetera, in the, uh, in the public interest. Uh, meanwhile, there, of course, the new left is in full bloom in, uh, uh, in the 1960s, and that causes a reaction among a number of other people and uh, eventually results in the great turn that uh, Commentary Magazine took, uh, not suddenly, but, uh, but within the space of a few years in, uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and the emergence of Commentary as a major, uh, the, 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 major uh, the other major poll uh, in the uh, in the neoconservative uh, universe, uh, which uh, of course uh, grows and grows in influence uh, up through the election of uh, uh, of Reagan, and re in whose administration neoconservatives, may, uh, many of them, uh, played a uh, rather a prominent role. And uh, uh, throughout this time, there was a, uh, also, of course, a, a backlash against uh, neoconservatives. Uh, the uh, traditional many con traditional conservatives regarded neoconservatives as Johnny-come-latelys, as uh, uh, upstarts, uh, as people who waltzed in only after they, you know, the, the, the real conservatives have been making the, the serious arguments all along and uh, flashed their fancy social science data as if they just invented uh, uh, the wheel when, in fact, the wheel had been invented long ago and had been turning nicely. And uh, there was, uh, of course, a, a fair bit of uh, resentment. There were actually some fairly fairly uh, fairly tough political struggles actually during the Reagan administration about what direction uh, the Reagan administration would take uh, in uh, ideas matters. There was a, uh, essentially a, a, a campaign, I mean a war, I, I don't like war as a metaphor, I think war is war and shouldn't be you know, recruited into, into discussions that are fundamentally peaceful. Uh, but, you know, there was, a, there was certainly some uh, back and forth over the question of whether uh, uh, Bill Bennett would become head of the National Endowment for uh, Humanities or whether Emmy Bradford would. And uh, that was, a, uh, uh, that, that was a, an, an early distillation of, I th of, of a critique that I think uh, continues to this day and, and in, uh, uh, in Professor Thompson's book. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, the neocon strain uh, persisted and and uh, and uh, and went on and on through the uh, uh, the Reagan administration. Uh, the uh, the collapse of uh, communism, I think, uh, came as a uh, uh, as, as a surprise to most uh, people, uh, including the people the neocon cold warriors in town who thought, uh, as indeed I did when I moved here in 1985, that I would spend most of my life waging the Cold War uh, in an order to in an effort to preserve 
uh, the, the, the possibility, of the, the, the actuality of, uh, of, of freedom uh, in America and possibly to uh, w elsewhere around the world. Um, but uh, the, the collapse of communism brought in, I think, probably the most celebrated or notorious elements, I suppose, of the, of the neoconservative uh, argument, which was Francis Fukuyama's reflections on the end of history and essentially raising the question of whether liberal democratic, democratic capitalism wasn't, in point of fact, a kind of final human answer uh, to how the world uh, ought to be uh, organized. Uh, the thesis was much derided, uh, much less was it actually read, and st still less understood, uh, but it was a uh, uh, it, but it was an interesting uh, kind of intellectual moment. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I think, you know, you see uh, uh, what begins as a, as a thought experiment that Charles Murray propounds in uh, a book in the early 1980s, namely, what would happen if we actually got rid of the welfare entitlement. Uh, it was posited as a thought of experiment because no one would, could conceivably imagine such a proposal being taken seriously as a policy proposal when, when uh, uh, when Charles first broached it in losing ground. Uh, by, by the mid-90s, it's becoming actually uh, something that is, that is a distinct political possibility. So you see, uh, uh, you see uh, uh, Bill Clinton himself so wanting to end welfare as we know it. Now, his emphasis was on as we know it, uh, I think, uh, which is to say he wanted to change it into something we would get to know and love more. Uh, but he kind of got tripped up by the election of Republican majorities in 1994, and they wanted to end welfare full stop, and uh, uh, after some back and forth, that actually happened. So you, you, in essence, you can see the way in which the, some of the ideas propounded in the, uh, uh, in, in, by neoconservatives in neoconservative venues sort of became more or less merged with uh, the mainstream of the, uh, uh, of the Republican Party at about that time. Uh, and I think that that has uh, uh, continued. Uh, meanwhile, abroad, we have uh, the extraordinary phenomenon of uh, uh, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, the, collapse, the split breakup of the Soviet Union, and the emergence in uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of countries that actually do want to be part of the West, want to engage uh, with uh, uh, the United States and Europe, want to you know, feel themselves to possess the same sort of uh, values. Uh, and uh, I think you can find, in addition to uh, some uh, uh, liberal uh, internationalists uh, who, who were very much in favor of pursuing an agenda that would, uh, uh, that would allow NATO to expand and that would draw these countries in and try to anchor them in Western institutions uh, and solidify their own internal democratic uh, processes and develop their uh, economies in a market uh, direction and so forth. Uh, in addition to that, you also have uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a real sense at the time that uh, uh, the, 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 that this is an important new project in the spread of freedom. And uh, uh, that is something that I think uh, the, the neocons were, uh, uh, were very much uh, uh, engaged in. So uh, now on, on to the present, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to, at the end of the Bush administration, the death of neoconservatism was pronounced uh, as it has been in the past, and, uh, and yet I find no particular evidence that this strain has disappeared. And I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and it's that, um, that neoconservatism, uh, which is difficult to speak of in the sense uh, that it is, uh, uh, you know, at best one's talking about an ideal type. Uh, by which I, by which I don't mean you know a pinnacle. I mean, I mean a, in the sense of you know a, an idea, a set of ideas. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Thompson has his spin on those his take on those ideas. I, I think uh, I would have another one, obviously. Uh, but uh, but again, it is it is as he notes rather rather hard to wrap your arms around. Uh, uh, wrap your arms around the animal because there is no, you know, there is no spokesman, uh, there is no uh, central uh, authority on the question of uh, of what neoconservatives think. There are only neoconservative thinkers, many of whom uh, disagree with each other. But if you had to, uh, if you had to say, well, what is, you know, what what is what is this current in American intellectual life, and what what is it, what does it bring to the table that enables it to persist from 1965 through 2011 without any sign of uh, uh, serious uh, uh, diminution of its uh, authority, influence, uh, uh, attraction. Um, I think you. I, I think I would say uh, that it, it is because neoconservatism is both soft and hard. Uh, it is hard uh, in the sense that it understands uh, power, uh, and it, uh, it it seeks to understand 
uh, political power, um, military power, uh, other forms of, uh, uh, of power. And, uh, and, and through the understanding, uh, better understanding of, of these things, to really try to understand better how to manage what is inarguably the world's most powerful nation. Uh, at the, there was a time when there were, we had a bipolar order and there were, uh, uh, you know, there was a, a central struggle over real power uh, in, in the world and there were things like proxy wars in, uh, uh, in Central America and Africa. Uh, that, uh, that, 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 was a, that was a moment at which clear thinking about power was very important and I think uh, uh, in a number of uh, uh, articles and uh, uh, commentary and, and elsewhere, some, uh, some, some very major contributions were made by neoconservatives to the understanding of that conflict and what it meant to wage it and what its implications are. But also con neoconservatism is soft, and it's soft in the sense uh, that, uh, that it's concerned about ideas and not just uh, any ideas and not just the ideas of philosophers uh, or of Plato, but actually of, uh, uh, of freedom. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the neoconservative uh, emphasis on uh, freedom has been uh, at, at the heart of the project for quite some time. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, the, the, the neoconservative critique of capitalism, uh, which was developed by Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell, Bell and the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism and Irving and several major uh, consequential essays that are still worth reading today, was essentially a riff on you know, an, an extension of Weber's uh, uh, analysis of capitalism, namely that these uh, that the system depended on uh, certain virtues that it did not itself produce, and that in fact, uh, in some respects, it acted to undermine. Uh, so it was it, it, this was not a critique of capitalism that was aimed at the undermining of capitalism. On the contrary, it was aimed. Uh, at, the, uh, at the preservation uh, of capitalism. And uh, it's uh, worthwhile to remember just exactly how uh, left-leaning uh, much uh, 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 public opinion was in, in the 1970s when uh, many people still thought that uh, wage and price controls were a good idea. Uh, and, uh, and, and more than that, that, uh, that there, was a, there was in no sense a, uh, uh, among uh, liberals uh, on the left side of the political spectrum, uh, which is to say not classical liberals, uh, there was no sense of uh, 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 chastity with regard to their uh, ambitions for the uh, for government, for the for the public purse, uh, etc. There was a let it all kind of hang out uh, moment. So this is uh, this, these ideas about freedom uh, are uh, uh, absolutely central, I think, to understanding neoconservatism, uh, both its uh, dom domestic element and uh, its uh, foreign. Uh, elements and they are classically liberal ideas. They are, their affinity is with Locke and with Mill, uh, and uh, not with uh, others. Um, and uh, uh, this soft and hard element, I think, stands in some somewhat in contrast with a, the more with with a, with, a, with, a, with a purely hard view, which is does exist in American society. It's in some respects in foreign policy. It's neo-realist, but I suppose if you. Uh, 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 it, 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 it was also, um, uh, you know, if, 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 if you have any sympathy for uh, um, people in um, Tunisia or Egypt or Libya fighting authoritarian governments, um, then uh, you're probably more a little more on the uh, neocon uh, end of the, uh, of the spectrum. And if you have more sympathy for the idea of stability and order that would result from uh, uh, keeping autocrats in power and keeping a lid on things and preventing uh, uh, the possibility of illiberal anti-democratic forces coming to power through democratic means, uh, then you would be, I think, in this in this harder realist vein that I'm describing. And of course, there's a soft strain, and that's uh, very much uh, uh, the, the the mushy liberalism uh, that uh, that we've all uh, uh, come to know and. Uh, uh, and, and understand that uh, large elements of it consist of wishing the world was a different place from what it is and then learning uh, or not learning uh, as a result of uh, uh, its stubborn uh, action against what one uh, ex ex expects. Um, so this, is the, this, uh, this soft and hard element uh, of neoconservatism is, I think, what accounts for its persistence. That's why it's going to be around for a long time to come. And uh, we can talk a little bit about Strauss if you want to in the Q&A, and we can get into the more, uh, uh, the more philosophical elements and charges, uh, and counter charges uh, that uh, 
that uh, Professor Thompson uh, raises. But uh, but let me just say that I, you know I, I think that the connection between Strauss and neoconservatism uh, is uh, is not uh, complicated. I think it's explicable uh, in that Strauss uh, was seriously interested in philosophical ideas and seriously interested in the question of politics and uh, and politics, uh, including. Uh, the power elements of it that were uh, then uh, increasingly out of vogue uh, in the academy. Uh, it used to be, you, if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, study power, you might go to Sam Huntington or Hans Morgenthau, uh, uh, people like that. They, there, there was a very robust conversation there, and it was not distinctly neoconservative. It was hard in the sense in which I had uh, uh, described it earlier. But by uh, uh, by the time uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the present generation say uh, Wolfowitz on, uh, I suppose that's Wolfowitz is sort of the linchpin of the argument in some sense for those who would like to uh, uh, draw a diabolical connection between uh, Strauss and uh, and neoconservatism. Um, the uh, by uh, by then uh, I I think uh, you went you went you, you might be attracted to Strauss or the Straussians because they talk seriously. Uh, about serious things, including uh, power and how it operates, and you wouldn't necessarily have an outlet uh, for uh, for thinking about things like that in other ways. And if you thought, uh, for whatever reason, that that was uh, going to be important uh, for your country uh, in the years ahead, then that would be uh, a good place to learn something about it, uh, not for the purpose of uh, a long-range project of the internal subversion of your country, uh, but in fact to ensure that it was capable of thriving uh, in a very challenging international environment and one that continues to be challenging today. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Let's take some questions now. Uh, please raise your hands, wait for a microphone to be brought to you, introduce yourself and any affiliation you're willing to admit to. Right here. Tim, Tim Carney, Washington Examiner. Um, my question, I, I would like you to address what he was saying, The what was that Kagan Crystal quote about both the, the foreign policy as well as the domestic policy being used to try to make Americans be better, the, the soul craft, state craft as soul craft, I guess would be. Is that something you think is very present in, in the neocon uh, th thought? Do you want to collect? Yeah, you can oh, say. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that's an especially uh, large element of, uh, uh, of neoconservative. Statecraft is soulcraft, by the way, is, is George Will's book title. Uh, so that is a kind of older, more paternalistic uh, form of, of, of conservatism, certainly not a, a libertarian form. But, uh, you know, I, 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 there is, uh, yes, it is true that um, uh, David Brooks wrote an article about uh, uh, national greatness and his aspirations uh, for uh, 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 for national greatness, and that and that Bill Crystal um, associated himself with some elements of that, uh, but th this was an article, uh, you know, and a couple of columns um, with a proposal that essentially was uh, went nowhere. Uh, you know, there, there there did not emerge a kind of national greatness rallying cry amongst uh, uh, amongst the, the neoconservatives, uh, apart from a couple of them, and uh, then again, uh, let alone an, anything like a a mass phenomenon. Um, now, I mean, at the time, my response to national greatness was I thought we were, you know, pretty busy, you know, being great in our own little way, you know, as things were. I mean, this was kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, the this, was, uh, this was a period in which we were kind of coping with trying to be, be the unipolar power in the world, you know. Uh, so I thought, I thought we had plenty to do in that respect. Um, some people thought we should, you know, in addition, go to Mars. And okay, I mean, if you want a project to go to Mars, but 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 I don't think that that, that there's a, uh, uh, I, I don't think that there's a great sort of sociological, um, thick description that you need uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, to get at this. I mean, is is, is you know, is Brooks uh, a conventional uh, conservative? Well, no. I mean, have you read his New York Times columns lately? Uh, so, uh, as to whether he is, you know, he is a, an archetypal figure of uh, uh, of, of neoconservatism, you know, I, I would, I think, I would, dis I would have, I would dispute that as well. Can I, David, can sure, I just say something very quickly on this? And that is, <clears throat> for the neoconservatives, uh, the great threat to the United States uh, is not has has never been 
uh, either communism uh, uh, nor uh, Islamic totalitarianism. The great threat to the United States is nihilism. It's philosophic nihilism. Uh, this is absolutely clear in the writings of Strauss, and it's clear in, in the writings of, of Irving Kristol. And that, that fear of nihilism, which, by the way, they take <clears throat> the, the source, the root of modern cultural, philosophic, moral nihilism, right, is not Heidegger, it's not Nietzsche, it's Lockean liberalism. This is the great stocking horse of Strauss and the neocons. Uh, so you go, straight from <clears throat> you go straight from the Declaration of Independence uh, to Boy George. Right. This, this is their view of the, of, of the history of, of the nihilistic idea which Strauss finds directly in, 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 in John Locke. And so it's fighting, it's combating nihilism, which, which is the, the great task uh, for, for uh, the, the, the deepest thinking Straussians. And uh, this notion of benevolent hegemony uh, and war uh, is one important way in which you fight uh, nihilism, which is the, as I said, the great threat uh, to uh, the West. Yes. Hi, I'm Mary Carrick. Um, I, I just, there was something, I have one comment, some questions. Um, William Crystal, in the Foreign Policy Initiative yesterday, issued a statement not only calling for us to do the, uh, the um, airspace thing, but also uh, limited strikes in um, in Libya. So um, there they is a lot of sable rattling there. Um, I had one question is if, um, for the neocon side, um, is if you believe in getting involved in all these rebellions, yet on the other hand, you like the government so much, why is it for decades now we've been buying out most of these um, horrible dictators, especially in Egypt, Egypt received the second highest amount of aid. And so, and, and the neocons all supported that because it gets to the other issue is why is it so many people who are neocons, um, although most of the ones I've seen appear to be native born Americans, promote um, foreign policy that serves the interest of Israel over the interest of the United States? And the other question I had is. Well, I think that's probably enough questions. <laughs> Oh, well, um, Lindbergh, by the way, is a Swedish name. <laughs> uh, if you think that there was any opinion in Israel that favored the uprisings in Egypt and the toppling of the Mubarak regime, I assure you, you are mistaken. Uh, it's a notion that there is, a, there is an identity of view between um, uh, neoconservatives and uh, uh, Likud uh, is, a, uh, is, is a conclusion that borders on something that I find very distasteful. Um, the uh, broader question of propping up dictators, well, you know what? Um, back in the day when Gene Kirkpatrick was writing uh, Dictatorships and Double Standards, which is a sort of seminal neoconservative uh, uh, argument from commentary, uh, her argument was that uh, if you acted rapidly to undermine authoritarian rulers who might in time liberalize their governments and enable democracy to take root, that if you undermined them, the alternative was not uh, a sudden onrush of uh, uh, democracy in a country, but rather uh, the likelihood that uh, less, uh, uh, the less attractive, less savory, more repressive elements, and specifically communists, uh, would take over the place. Uh, so, uh, what do we conclude from this? One, uh, that uh, I, I think that uh, it's pretty clear that, that, that an interest in liberty was the essential question uh, and the essential premise uh, throughout this period. Second, that uh, in the absence of a, uh, a, commun a serious communist threat, uh, there would be no particular reason to be supportive of, uh, uh, of uh, thuggish uh, dictators. Uh, but rather uh, their uh, opposition. And third, uh, that nevertheless, uh, one uh, must, I suppose, be wary of something other than uh, communism as a possible worse outcome. Uh, now, uh, at the moment, it seems as if most, uh, most of my neoconservative uh, friends, uh, oh, I signed that letter, by the way, uh, have reached the conclusion that uh, 
that propping up uh, 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 dictators uh, is uh, not something uh, we're uh, we're going to be in. Uh, uh, we, we should not be in the business of doing. Uh, but at the same time, I think you know if uh, if if the result is going to be. Uh, uh, anarchy and chaos, then um, it would probably be uh, a good idea to avoid that as well. In the back there. Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. For Mr. Thompson, looking back over the experience of the past 30 years in terms of America's role in the world, its conduct of foreign and military policy, how would you distinguish, either in philosophic or in practical terms, neoconservatives from neoliberals? Um, th that's, uh, for me, that's a tough question. Um, we have one foreign policy chapter in the book, which my co-author, uh, Yaron Brook, uh, wrote. He's the foreign policy expert. So uh, I I'm, I'm afraid I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to punt on, on the question of neoliberal foreign policy, which uh, I don't feel in any way competent uh, to speak about. OK, over there. Hi, uh, Matt Dust, Center for American Progress. Uh, thanks to both of you for a really interesting discussion. Um, I think right after this, I was planning on heading over to the Foreign Policy Initiatives uh, um, event on the uprisings in, in the Arab world, that kind of getting to Mr. Lindbergh's point that it, neoconservatives are still very much around, still very much engaged in, in, in the debate. But I'm kind of curious to Mr. Thompson, I find a lot of what you said about the, the roots of the neoconservative tendency to be interesting, but how much of the continued influence um, in Washington, in policy debates, do you think is explainable by, you know, simple fundraising? I mean, it seems to me if part of your argument is that we need to go to war a lot, you're not going to have a lot of problem raising money for lots of new think tanks from people who make bombs. Um, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, though I'm a critic uh, uh, of neoconservatism, I'm not sure that my criticism uh, would, uh, would go so far as to suggest uh, that they're on, on the take from uh, arms manufacturers. Um, what I would say, though, is that the neoconservatives have, have been extraordinarily successful, and this in part goes to uh, Todd's opening uh, remarks uh, about the persistence of the neoconservatives, uh, which he is absolutely right. I mean, they have persisted uh, in playing a major role in American uh, intellectual life and policy discussions now for several decades. Uh, and I've written an obituary, so how do, how do we explain the continued persistence of the neoconservatives? Uh, it's, it's a reasonable and, and, a, and a good question. Um, the neoconservatives, in my view, are the dominant intellectual force in the conservative intellectual movement today. They, they have more of the best university appointments than any other faction, one might say, in the conservative intellectual movement. They control uh, many of the major think tanks. They control uh, many of the best magazines. Uh, and more importantly, and this sort of goes to, I think, uh, your point, uh, they control um, uh, many of the largest conservative philanthropic foundations. So m much, uh, I mean, if you, if you are a student at all of the conservative intellectual movement, uh, you know, there, there is a sense in which we all know this to be true, you know, follow the money, and in following the money, you will see that uh, uh, their, con their control, and Irving Kristol was actually very much, I think, to his credit, uh, I mean, he was one of the first people to see that, um, you know, he who controls the philanthrop philanthropic foundations will also then control, to a certain degree, uh, the intellectual movement. And so very early in the 70s and early 80s, Crystal uh, played a major role in, in, in starting and in running uh, many of these philanthropic foundations and then in the distribution of, of, of monies. Uh, and, and it was at that point that I think you can see a, a real shift within the conservative intellectual movement uh, away from both the libertarian and the more traditionalist wings of the conservative movement toward neoconservatism. Uh, and so m many of, of the, the best uh, think tanks, 
uh, were started during this period with monies uh, from these, these, uh, fill these foundations that were now under the control uh, of, of the neoconservatives. Let's take a question in the row in front of that. Uh, Trevor Burris from the Cato Institute. Uh, two quick questions. I didn't. You mentioned it just now, but the relationship between neoconservatism and conservatism, because it kind of sounds to me like neoconservatism is, in your interpretation, conservatism with a grandiose sense of self-importance, jingoism, and power, and maybe a Soviet menace. And then the second question is, how would you relate your interpretation of neoconservative? So it's conservatism to Carl Schmitt and Spangler, or any one of that sort of 1920s fascism era? Um, well, there, I mean, there is a very real sense in which, at least within the conservative, the, broad, the broadest tent that we can possibly imagine of the conservative intellectual movement, there is a sense in which I think it is appropriate to say, as the Wall Street Journal did recently, and as uh, others have over the course of the last several years, well, in fact, David Brooks said it, we're all neocons now. And the reason why I think there is some credibility to this, I mean, the reason why I think the neoconservatives uh, dominate the conservative intellectual movement uh, is in part for the reasons I've already suggested, namely their control of the philanthropic foundations, but more importantly because, uh, I mean, the, it's, it does seem to me that most, uh, certainly many of the best intellectuals within the broader conservative intellectual movement are neoconservatives. I mean, I, I, I do think that, um, I mean, look, I, just, just to be autobiographical, if I could for a moment, uh, as, as Todd was, um, I lived in that world for many years. Uh, I was never a Straussian nor a neocon, but I lived in that world. I was trained uh, throughout my entire university career by Straussians and was entirely sympathetic to their mode of analysis, particularly their mode of analysis of modern culture. And it's extraordinarily powerful. I mean, they have done through Commentary Magazine uh, and, and several other, and well, uh, Policy Review even, uh, they have offered some of the very best critiques that we have of the new left. Uh, they have offered the very, uh, amongst the very best critiques of feminism uh, and egalitarianism. And, uh, and in doing that, I mean, they really have come to be uh, in, uh, a powerful intellectual force. Uh, and, and, and all of that, I think, is very much to their credit. But they, they th th as I said, the very best neoconservative intellectuals are at the very best universities in the United States. And you cannot say that the same thing about um, the intellectuals of the other strains of uh, the larger conservative movement. On to your question about uh, Carl Schmitt, just very briefly, uh, I have a discussion of this uh, in, um, in, in my book, uh, Strauss, Leo Strauss's uh, relationship to, uh, to Carl Schmitt. The first thing I want to mention is this. In 1933, Strauss wrote uh, a letter that's only become available in the last couple of years to his old friend Carl Loveth, uh, when, where he says, that in order to combat the principles of, of Nazism, we have to do so with the principles of the right. And he names as the principles of the right fascism, authoritarianism, and imperialism. Right? And at the same time, within the same year, Strauss is writing a review of Carl Schmitt's um, a small book, The Concept of the Political, wherein Strauss is trying to deepen uh, Schmidt's critique of Enlightenment liberalism. Uh, and Strauss says to Schmidt that you have to find a horizon beyond liberalism. Because in the end, Strauss says his criticism of Schmidt is that by taking your anti-Enlightenment views back to Hobbes, you are, in fact, only supporting the liberal view. Because Strauss viewed Hobbes as, uh, as the philosophic founder of modern liberalism. So Strauss says you have to find a horizon beyond liberalism, that is to say, beyond Hobbes, which he first takes to medieval political philosophy, Al-Farabi and Maimonides, but ultimately, and most importantly, back to Plato. Um, you know, I just want to come in on, the, uh, uh, on, on this just with two um, brief points. It's probably a subject for a uh, much longer discussion. Uh, I, the, uh, the Strauss letter um, to the Earth, which is uh, which uh, Brad just alluded to, 
Uh, I think the, the point that Strauss was making was that uh, liberalism was an exhausted force in Germany by the early 1930s. It no longer had the oomph to resist uh, the, uh, uh, the National Socialism. There was a German right uh, that was not National Socialist. Uh, it was not, uh, it didn't have much in common with uh, uh, contemporary, uh, with our contemporary ideas about, uh, about bourgeois liberalism, uh, but it was not the Nazis. Uh, and uh, I think Strauss's uh, argument in the letter uh, is, uh, is, is that it is only this force within Germany will be, would have the potential um, to resist uh, the the Nazi takeover. So I, I you know, it's po I, Brad's reading of, of the letter, in my view, is uh, is out of context and uh, uh, and somewhat tendentious. Well, the, I have to. I'm sorry. Let me just respond very quickly to this. Uh, it's it's in fact in context. The context is uh, that um, uh, uh, one of Strauss's friends, the philosopher Jonas, describes Strauss at the time. Uh, as being one of the earliest friends to fascism. Uh, this from, from a friend of Strauss's. Uh, and Strauss also at the time, we now have evidence, and I talk about it in the book, Strauss read um, the, the, encyclopedia, the Italian encyclopedia article by uh, Mussolini on the principles of fascism, uh, co-authored with Giovanni Gentili. And if you read this, this essay uh, by Mussolini and Gen Gentili on the principles of fascism, it's very hard to distinguish between Strauss and Mussolini. No, actually, it's not really very difficult to distinguish between Strauss and Mussolini, but, uh, but I'll just enter my, uh, we'll reserve that for another day. They're on the corner. John Purdy, the Fund for American Studies. For uh, Brad Thompson, when you mentioned the Cato Unbound essays, you failed to mention Patrick Deneen, uh, his critique. I wanted to know if, you, if there was a reason for that. And secondly, do you agree with Todd Lindbergh that the obituary portion of the title is greatly exaggerated? Right. Uh, well, you did notice that I left, uh, that I did not thank one of the three respondents to my Cato Unbound essay. Um, I will respond to Patrick Deneen in print uh, or electronically at Cato Unbound uh, uh, after I return from this trip to Washington. Um, it, uh, it, it's hard to know what to say in, in civil and polite company about an essay that is so fundamentally dishonest, intellectually dishonest, um, uh, uh, and more um, that um, uh, I, I, will, I will just say for now uh, that, uh, that uh, all of you who have been following this uh, public conversation uh, should wait for my response, my public response, uh, which will be coming uh, within the next week. Um, I'll just, I think it's probably best to leave it at, at, at that. And your second question on, on the title of the book, the, uh, the, the, title, uh, is, the title is ironic, and it's ironic in two ways. Uh, first, it's ironic in that uh, it's a play on a title of an essay by Irving Kristol. Irving Kristol once wrote an essay called Socialism, an Obituary uh, for an Idea, an essay which, by the way, uh, is uh, one where uh, Kristol defends the moral superiority of socialism to capitalism. Uh, it's also uh, an obituary, I think, in the ways that Todd suggested, namely um, that uh, though Neoconservatism is obviously still very much alive. Uh, one might describe this book as a prolegomena to any future obituary, uh, in uh, in the sense that uh, in Todd, uh, and I'm glad one person, namely Todd, got the reference to Charlotte Corday uh, writing Marat's obituary on on the way to to Paris. Um, yes, um, the book is polemical in the, to the extent, although I'd like to think. Uh, that uh, it's, it's philosophical in many ways. Uh, it is polemical in the sense that uh, the goal is to take, is to unmask neoconservatism, to take it on, uh, and then ultimately to defeat it on uh, the intellectual battlefield. Let's take the last question right here. Bill Dennis. What, raise your hand, Bill. Bill Dennis. You can hear me without these things. Uh, 
Brad, I haven't made an opportunity to uh, read your book yet, so I guess I'll have to after this. You, you probably will. deal with this in, in there. But do you think all Straussians are neocons and all neocons are Straussians? Because I think there are different roots for both those groups besides Straussianism. Yeah, that's, 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 a, fair, that's a good and a, f a fair question. Um, uh, no, not all, not all Straussians uh, are neocons, uh, uh, although I think uh, all Straussians, to one degree or another, are at the very least friendly uh, to neoconservatism. Uh, but I think it, it is fair to say that, in my, certainly in my experience, and I know that world very well, uh, most Straussians do incline toward uh, neoconservatism, if not being uh, full-out uh, uh, neocons. Now, the reverse is not true. It, is not, it would not be true to say, however, that, most, uh, or e that all or even most neocons are Straussians. So, for instance, the first generation of neoconservatives, the most famous generation of neoconservatives, Daniel Bell, Nathan Glazer, uh, Moynihan, all that group, none of those people could be remotely considered uh, to be Straussians. Uh, of that generation, of the original generation of neoconservatives, I think really only Irving Kristol uh, could be uh, considered to be a Straussian, and in a very peculiar way. He's a Straussian in the sense that he was, unlike most Straussians, he was never trained uh, philosophically by Strauss or any of Strauss's students. He came to Strauss on his own. Uh, but I will say, though, that the neoconservative, and I do regard Strauss, or, excuse me, Crystal, to be the heart and soul of neoconservatism. He's the only neoconservative who openly and publicly identified himself as being a neoconservative. I mean, Daniel Bell and Nathan Glazer, for instance, had, uh, well, Bell repeatedly said that he was not a neoconservative, and Glazer only sometimes. Uh, but it's those neoconservatives who centered around the world of Irving Crystal who I think have had uh, the, the greatest um, uh, influence upon them by, uh, uh, by Strauss. And, and William Crystal, Irving's son, uh, is, uh, was himself uh, trained by, by Straussians and is a, is a self-identified uh, Straussian. Uh, and um, David Brooks, um, who writes just like Irving Crystal, um, and like Todd from the University of Chicago, uh, I haven't, uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, of his self-identification relative to Strauss, but there are certainly strains uh, of thought in David Brooks that one can, one can find in Strauss. Todd, do you want to address that question? Uh, yeah. I think, uh, well, uh, I don't think, David spent a lot of time with Straussians at the University of Chicago. I could be wrong about that, but uh, uh, we overlap. We were a year apart, and uh, he certainly wasn't uh, in any of the Bloom classes that uh, that I attended at the time. Uh, I don't. Um, I should clear up. You know, I don't really. I, I, I've said. I've written. I, I don't mind if people call me a neoconservative. It's okay. Um, it, uh, as long as people understand that. You know, the the the. I think the living strain of of neoconservatism at the moment is actually a sort of classical liberal strain, uh, and that that uh, has a tendency to uh, uh, get lost a little bit in some of these darker speculations. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, uh, it, it's true that Strauss decided to start a school, um, and that that's, it was an interesting decision. Uh, on his part, other professors in his position have made different decisions. So he wanted it was clearly something that he wanted to, to get going. But I, but I'm certainly not a member of it. Or, uh, and uh, uh, and the fact that uh, that one learned something um, from uh, Strauss uh, or students of Strauss, I think, doesn't require you to uh, uh, to subscribe to the uh, the whole architecture. Uh, but that said, I, I think there's a, a, there's a great deal of value there. Uh, and uh, it is, if, if you uh, subscribe to a school, you're essentially um, going all in and maybe um, possibly uh, denying yourself the opportunity to do anything like offer a kind of fundamental challenge of the premises and, and so forth. And some people 
people, people make that decision and, and, and are happy with that decision. Uh, but I, but I, just as much, I think, uh, there is... Uh, by the way, this is hardly unique to Strauss. There's certainly uh, no shortage of Rawlsians out in the academy uh, anyway, and that, is, that too, is a, is a school. Uh, but uh, you know, I think that, uh, in the end, uh, the, the Straussian neocon connection is best explained, as I was trying to get at, and, uh, and, uh, which is to say, uh, that if you want to, if if you are interested in political philosophy, uh, presumably that is because you're interested in political power, uh, in the structure of political uh, order, uh, in regimes and types of regime, and the way in which a type of regime might affect its behavior inside its borders and outside its borders, uh, in. Uh, the question of the clash of differing regimes um, in uh, the question of war uh, and peace and the circumstances in which those resist. Uh, the, uh, and, I, and that is, if you are interested in those questions, you may also be interested in having uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an impact on, uh, on, on policy uh, in, in your own country. And I think that's, I don't think we need to go a whole lot deeper than that in order to find uh, what uh, what accounts for th not the identity, but but what is in fact you know substantial overlap between these uh, between these two things. All right, thank you, Todd Lindbergh. Thank you, Brad Thompson. We uh, we have books and lunch upstairs, so please join us up in the Winter Garden.